So good afternoon everyone. This is Arun Sharma from Midasoft welcoming you all to the session fourth of Midas Elite Center course. Today we'll be covering soil structure interaction analysis for shore excavations. And MyDesoft holds the rights uh, to the material that I've shared in this presentation. So without uh, our consent, please don't uh, share or uh, reproduce any material of this presentation. So these are the learning objectives for today's session. Um, at the end of this course, participants will be able to understand the key advantages of utilizing numerical analysis for shored excavation. They will also be able to understand the comparison with conventional design process and the conditions that necessitate the 3D analysis for showed excavation. So this course is divided into four chapters. Chapter 1 will uh, talk about the background of, uh, deep, uh, of uh, deep excavations, what are the different types of uh, supporting systems and what is the design process for each one of them and uh, the approach the second uh, chapter will deal with the approaches of uh, shore excavation design so what are the earth pressure how they are computed what are the supporting systems how we uh, choose what which supporting system uh, is relevant for what kind of excavation then in the third chapter we'll talk about how to use numerical analysis and uh, more importantly we'll be focusing on uh, how to choose an appropriate constitutive material model, how to uh, simulate the supporting system and how they compare uh, uh, with the conventional approach. And in the end the third, fourth chapter will, uh, uh, will cover a case study of uh, high-rise building foundation design that required uh, deep excavation and uh, complex uh, supporting system. So let's start with chapter 1 which is deep excavation. So as we all know the definition of deep excavation is something like this. The removal of soil to construct a foundation and underground structure is called excavation. Now depending upon to what depth and dimensions you uh, uh, excavate, you, uh, you deal with either deep excavation or a shallow excavation. Usually for building foundations and underground structures we have to go deeper into the earth and therefore every time we are doing an excavation for a building structure or a, a foundation of a building structure or underground uh, storage structure, you are uh, dealing with deep excavations. So let's see what are the different types of uh, shored excavation systems available. So for shallow trenches where uh, which are primarily used for laying down the pipelines or sewer lines at uh, near ground level or utilities uh, uh, lines. So for this uh, usually the trenches are shallow and uh, are pretty narrow also. So we have these kinds of uh, shallow trenches supports that are applied at close intervals. Then uh, we are all familiar with sheet pile which is a uh, uh, very thick uh, uh, corrugated metal plate which is uh, tied with each other in the transverse direction to form a wall. So this is called a sheet pile. Uh, and in these uh, couple of uh, slides that will be following, we'll be talking about what are the different types of shoring uh, uh, systems. I'll not be talking about where they are used and why. That is uh, something we'll be discussing in the following chapters. Then we have a uh, soldier and legging uh, supporting system where we have uh, vertical steel pile members that are uh, drilled into the ground and uh, we have uh, timber or concrete laggings in the transverse, uh, transverse direction to provide uh, uh, the support to the excavation. Then uh, the another way of uh, uh, supporting the excavation or uh, uh, the wall is soil nailing where we use uh, uh, 
long uh, rebars or uh, um, or iron nails to hold the slope in place and this type of uh, method is uh, useful depending upon the slope of the system. The another uh, method of uh, supporting the excavation is through bracings uh, like excavation bracings which are usually uh, used at uh, closed excavation sites and uh, if uh, you are dealing with open systems then you can use tie backs where we tie the walls through uh, the walls to the uh, uh, excavation uh, slope itself. So now let's move on to the design process of these excavation supporting systems. So I'll go through uh, the steps that are involved in the design process one by one starting with the first step where we have to select the type of lateral earth pressure that are expected to act on the wall. So usually as we know there are three types of uh, uh, lateral earth pressures earth pressure at uh, active, at rest and passive. So here you can see uh, the directions where these uh, earth pressures are acting. If this is our supporting system then uh, behind uh, the supporting system the earth pressure is uh, considered active. In front it's passive and uh, at rest is the earth pressure which is at a stable set of far away from the actual uh, excavation uh, edge. But some points uh, are to be considered while uh, assessing these pressures. The first point is that most commonly used earth pressures are active and at rest. Then you must consider water pressure at poor drainage sites. So if we don't have a good drainage system at the site, uh, you can assume uh, a huge uh, poor water pressure due to the soil uh, water inside or retained by the soil that can cause additional or uh, increased earth pressure onto the supporting system. And depending upon the codes uh, that you are using or depending upon the country you are in, you might be required to multiply this factor of safety to the pressure itself to uh, before uh, assessing the design needs. Now let's move on to the step two where, which is to apply external stability checks to ensure the overall stability of the shoring system. So let's see what are the external stability checks. The first one is the passive resistance of shoring system which is actually the uh, factor of safety against sliding. And as you can see, the empirical formula is pretty straightforward, resisting horizontal forces divided by driving horizontal forces. And the minimum factor of safety required for this uh, 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 stability check is 1.2. Then we have to ensure the safety against uh, overturning with a factor of safety of uh, minimum 1.5. And as you can see, the formula it is pretty simple, straightforward. It's a ratio of resisting moments to the driving moments. And let's move on to the third step where we have to determine the bearing stability of the shoring wall. Now if this is uh, our uh, retaining wall or the supporting system here, we must check the bearing stability of uh, the uh, soil on which this wall is constructed. It is critical if your wall is based on soil and not on stable rock strata. And the bearing stresses should be checked for both heel as well as toe because if uh, the system is mobilized and it goes for an over uh, turning failure then the stresses at the toe uh, would increase and the heel would reduce. So we have to consider the bearing stresses at both locations. Then the uh, bearing stresses are checked against the permissible bearing stresses of the soil and the minimum factor of safety should be 3. So if you are able to get this check and the factor of safety is uh, 3 or uh, greater than that, then you don't uh, uh, need to consider any settlement control. But if not, 
then you have to take measures for uh, assessing the settlement that will be occurring underneath the wall and uh, if there are certain measures to control it. Then the fourth step is to check against global failure. Now if you look at this diagram here we talked about the factor of safety against uh, overturning, against sliding and these are all external uh, uh, factors but uh, the factors that are beyond our control are actually the settlement of the soil underneath uh, the wall itself and the complete failure of the soil slope. So if the failure occurs something like this which uh, sweeps out the entire uh, failure surface then uh, you can't really do anything about it uh, through uh, by assessing the factor of safety. So how you can ensure this uh, uh, safety against global failure. So for this, this type of failure as we know is caused due to the soil below the retaining wall and uh, if you are working on sites which have weak soil strata or you are working on hill sites, uh, this check is essential. So for this check you must perform a numerical analysis on these sites. So once you identify that you are uh, working at one of these sensitive sites with poor ground conditions, it automatically calls for a numerical analysis to assess whether the soil or the slope will fail uh, causing the uh, global failure of the supporting system. And the fifth and the last step for design process is to check the shoring system for a structural stability. So here we need to, uh, it is necessary to check the individual components of your uh, shoring system. If you are working with wall, if you are working with nails, if you are working with tie backs, if you are working with bracings, you must compute the section size, reinforcement if you are dealing with reinforced concrete and the length of the uh, members that are uh, needed to give the structural stability to your uh, shoring system. And in order to design these, uh, these shoring components optimally, you must have accurate design forces. And uh, this is a very uh, big component of the entire design process. If you don't have uh, accurate forces, you will always end up with over safe structures and which will be uh, uh, which will not be cost effective and uh, you'll see later on in the uh, following chapters when the size of the structure increases uh, uh, be uh, because you are dealing with deep excavations then cost of the structure the time of the construction uh, is a sensitive issue and that uh, creates a big difference on your bids. So for deep excavations, these parameters are more important as compared to the shallow trenches or uh, uh, shallow excavations. So this brings us uh, to the end of chapter 1. Uh, let me quickly summarize uh, the points we learned here. So deep excavation means removal of soil for foundation and underground structure. Different types of shoring systems are available like shallow trenches, excavation bracings, tie bags, sheet piles, soil nails, soldier piles and lagging and different shoring systems are used based on different site requirements. The design process of the shoring system includes step one governing lateral pressure determination which is usually active or at rest earth pressure. Then external stability against sliding must be checked with a factor of safety of 1.2 and overturning stability should be checked uh, with a minimum factor of safety as 1.5. The bearing stability check is critical for poor soil. The minimum factor of safety should be 3 otherwise settlement control might be needed. Global failure check at hillside and soft grounds and unstable strata is needed. So for which you need to perform numerical analysis. And the structural design 
of each component with accurate design forces is uh, very very essential so now we'll move on to our first quiz which will have three questions the duration will be five minutes the questions are multiple choice chapter We'll be talking about, about the different approaches for show excavation design. So we'll start, start with the, the uh, earth pressure discussion. So the basic concept of earth pressure is pretty uh, simple and straightforward as we all know. This is our retaining structure or supporting system where we have earth on either side Obviously, since we have excavated on this side, uh, the there will be uh, earth at a higher height behind this uh, retaining structure or uh, supporting system. And due to the height here, we'll have uh, earth pressure actively acting on the wall to cause it uh, its uh, uh, failure. So therefore, this pressure on the wall towards the earth is called active earth pressure and the formula is pretty simple straightforward as you can see where Ka is the uh, earth pressure uh, active earth pressure coefficient then there is earth pressure at rest which is actually acting at some way away from the wall at a stable condition and the earth pressure is actually uh, directly proportional to the height uh, at which we are talking from these uh, from the uh, from the top so basically uh, this earth pressure is uh, is k naught times the height times the uh, density and the k naught is actually a, a coefficient which is uh, computed based on the internal angle of friction and you can see the formulation for non consolidated uh, soil strata and for consolidated or over consolidated soil strata. I'll not go into the details of these equations. These are uh, something we all know and have read during our uh, 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 geotechnical courses 101 or soil mechanics 101. And then we have the uh, passive earth pressure which is on the uh, other side of the supporting structure which is here and it is also active. Sometimes this pressure could be critical but uh, majority of the time we always go for uh, active earth pressure or earth pressure at rest. Then the apparent earth pressure diagram that was that were proposed by Tergazi and Peck and uh, Peck in 1967 and 1969 uh, we found that for the supporting structure depending upon the soil strata the pressure uh, uh, definition is different depending upon the soil strata as you can see if this is the height edge and these are the intermediate uh, let's say bracings or supporting systems then uh, the pressure is more or less constant throughout the depth and uh, the coefficient of earth pressure uh, is determined uh, based on this formula whereas if you are working with stiff or fissured clay the variation is somewhat different you see uh, a triangular tapering for the first quarter of the height then the second uh, half is a constant and then the third quarter of the uh, or the last quarter I should say uh, is uh, varying again and the pressure variation is from 0.2 to 0.4 times uh, density times height then if you are talking about soft to medium clays then it is a different uh, variation altogether you see for the first quarter the uh, pressure varies and then it stabilizes for the rest of the depth of the soil strata so two things we have we can observe from here that soil pressure definitely varies uh, depending upon the soil type you are using and it definitely varies with the depth of the excavation and uh, if the depth of the excavation is uh, very uh, deep then these variations uh, are 
different from the realistic behavior. We'll talk about that in a short while. So as we saw, the earth pressure varies with height depending upon the soil type. These formulas and theory work brilliantly for shallow excavations. But for deep excavations, as, we, uh, as the depth goes on increasing, the variation of earth pressure is larger uh, as compared to the uh, conventional methods that we just saw in the previous uh, slide. So therefore, the estimation of earth pressure becomes critical and for deep excavations, engineers prefer using numerical analysis. So this is the first time we are introducing you to numerical analysis and, uh, we'll, uh, and you must uh, understand that earth pressure is a critical uh, component of the entire design process. So let us see how uh, the two methods are different. Method one is the conventional method that we have been using all this time. So the biggest difference between conventional method and numerical analysis method is the application of the earth pressure. So under conventional method, the earth pressure is basically an input parameter. Engineer has to calculate the earth pressure depending upon the uh, formula you just saw in the previous slide and then apply that earth pressure to the wall and uh, we are basically doing the structural stability design of the supporting uh, system based on that earth pressure. This method has been used uh, very extensively uh, and for a really long time and it works brilliantly like I said for shallow foundations or shallow excavations. But let's see uh, what is uh, numerical analysis all about. So numerical analysis, the earth pressure is actually the output result. So this is uh, from after the numerical analysis, you will obtain earth pressure. Whereas in conventional method, you input earth pressure. So engineer has to create mesh for ground as well as for the wall and then assign a constitutive material model for the soil and the stress and strains are calculated based on constitutive model and external loads that are applied and after analysis engineer can obtain stresses or earth pressure for each direction so you must be wondering uh, why we have to do uh, numerical analysis when we can uh, easily compute the earth pressure from the previous uh, uh, previously discussed formula it's because when our height of or the depth of excavation increases these formulas and the variations that they propose are no longer uh, valid and uh, therefore if you are dealing with deep excavations you you must use numerical analysis Otherwise, your cost of construction, cost of material, time, everything will go beyond proportion and you will end up with a, uh, either a very oversaved design, which is economically not viable, or uh, you will be at risk uh, with different uh, adjacent structures uh, stability. Now let's briefly talk about uh, the selection of different supporting systems. So the so first thing that we should bear in mind is that there is no one size fits all solution for uh, uh, the excavation supporting systems. And the second important point is that the first step to re uh, is is to read the plans, specifications, geotechnical reports to understand the constraints and the conditions that will be encountered. As I discussed in the previous chapter that there are different types of supporting systems and they depend upon the uh, uh, site specifications. So uh, uh, this point is reinforcing what uh, we just discussed.
Then let's talk about shallow trenches. There are temporary uh, support methods such as trench boxes, shoring, bracing system or hydraulic shoring systems can be utilized for the support. I am getting some comments from our users so uh, sorry from our attendees so I'll be going over these questions in a little while because I have moved on uh, with the session so once uh, we are at uh, towards the end of the session open for discussion then I'll be taking up those points but uh, don't hesitate to uh, keep your questions uh, till the end keep uh, sending it to us and we'll be going over uh, them towards the end of the session. Thank you. Now resu resuming the presentation here. So, uh, so let's talk about trench boxes uh, where we should use trench boxes and uh, uh, where uh, other types of supporting systems are sufficient. So trench boxes are basically used when you have to uh, get your workers down in the trench to uh, set things up such as laying of pipelines or uh, uh, utility lines or some fixtures that you have to apply. So uh, the trench boxes basically support the walls as well as uh, uh, the soil uh, to fail and cause cave-ins and prevent uh, accidents. But uh, if you don't want, don't have to get the workers in uh, the trench, then most of the time the shallow trenches, uh, bracing systems are used. And for utility uh, trench excavations, cross trench bracings is used. But uh, cross trench bracing, as we all know, it's uh, uh, somewhat restricts the work area. So if uh, the need is to get someone in the utility trench and work we, uh, it is recommended to go for box trench because safety is uh, the most important thing uh, but if uh, it is something that could be managed from outside the trench itself then uh, cross trench bracing is uh, the next best option. Now that was for uh, shallow uh, trenches. Now let's move on to the deep cuts. So the excavation depths that are exceeding 10 to 20 feet require specialized planning for supports. Like I mentioned, uh, all the support systems depend upon the site conditions and soil conditions and the dimensions of the excavation. Deeper you go, more material you need. So you have to optimize your uh, support conditions so that you don't uh, cause any stability risk to your existing structure as well as adjacent structure. So these should be dealt with caution. So the support systems that are popularly used for deep cuts include uh, soldier pile and lagging, soil nails, uh, excavation bracings and tie backs. So we'll cover uh, each one of them very briefly. So this, uh, the soldier piles and lagging uh, method is uh, very commonly used and uh, but if you are dealing with sites which are uh, which are having soil layers that are completely cohesionless let's say uh, sand strata then this type of uh, 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 support system should be avoided but if you can't uh, avoid and that is a constraint that you have to deal with then a sh uh, soil sheeting is to be applied on the surface of the laggings in order to get uh, the uh, cohesion uh, resistance going along with the laggings. I hope this uh, explanation is clear. Then the next method and very popular method is soil nailing which is a rapid economical and the least disruptive means of construction constructing excavation support systems but it requires an unusual amount of handwork craftsmanship and your technical knowledge to construct these uh, type of supporting system
for narrow excavations excavation bracings with internal struts are most appropriate because they are uh, are narrow in nature and they are deep you can't really go in and do soil nailing uh, so it is better to have uh, 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 internal struts to provide the required support then another way uh, of uh, providing the support and a very popular one is uh, anchors or tiebacks now the advantage of using anchors and tiebacks is that they eliminate any kind of obstruction in the excavation and uh, if you are if you are uh, applying struts to open uh, excavation sites uh, then you are actually limiting your work scope uh, and uh, causing uh, uh, obstruction so if you are dealing with uh, uh, open or closed excavation sites and you can uh, do with uh, without uh, struts, I would say it is better to go with tiebacks. And uh, tieback systems are generally very successful in preventing the movement uh, of the excavation walls. Now this brings us to the end of chapter 2 so let me quickly summarize what we learned in this chapter so calculation of earth pressure varies based on soil type and the gases and peck formula that are commonly used design of shoring system as per conventional method involves earth pressure as an input parameter that is calculated based on the prevalent formula Design of shoring system as per numerical analysis uses constitutive material models as per soil conditions and gives earth pressure as an output for structural design or check of the uh, shoring system. Numerical analysis is must for deep excavation. And support selection depends upon soil type, dimensions, and purpose of excavation, whether it is a utility or non-utility excavation. Shallow trenches usually use trench boxes where workers need protection against cave-ins. Otherwise, cross trench bracings would suffice. And deep excavation exceeding 10 to 20 feet requires specialized planning for support needing numerical analysis. And finally, tiebacks eliminate obstruction and prevent wall movement, while strut should be used only for narrow excavation where tiebacks can be installed. I hope the explanation was uh, useful and now we are at, so I see everyone has submitted the quiz so let's move on so let's move on to the chapter number three that how to use numerical analysis for uh, performing the deep excavation uh, supporting system design Let's start with the constitutive material model. As you can see uh, from the slide, there are different types of material models and they are used for different, uh, to simulate different behavior depending upon the soil. So as you can see, we have linear elastic behavior, transversely isotropic, then we have drucker prager we have Mohr Coulomb, we have modified Mohr Coulomb, uh, which is actually for elastoplastic and cap hardening behavior, then we have Hook and Brown, which is for elastoplastic, we have hyperbolic for nonlinear elastic, etc., etc. Now, as you can see from this slide, we have uh, highlighted or uh, used uh, bold for Mohr Coulomb and modified Mohr Coulomb. This automatically goes to show that these are the two main material models or the constitutive material models that we most often use. 
and uh, out of these two uh, Mohr Coulomb is the more popular one and uh, we use Mohr Coulomb more often than a modified Mohr Coulomb or advanced constitutive material model. So I'll go into the definition of these uh, uh, models, what are the parameters and why they are used. So as you can see here uh, for the application of Mohr Coulomb and advanced models, so I will refer to uh, modified Mohr Coulomb as advanced models or hardening model so that there is uh, less confusion. So for shear soil failure, for soil shear failure, we use uh, Mohr Coulomb model. And we also use equivalent linear stiffness for compaction or unloading behavior. So Mohr Coulomb model alone doesn't suffice. It also requires an equivalent linear stiffness for the compaction and unloading behavior when you're dealing with excavations. But if you are uh, looking to simulate a nonlinear compaction or shear failure uh, analysis, then we use advanced models such as hardening model or modified Mohr Coulomb. And as you can see, there are various types of uh, field tests that are conducted and theories based on which the parameters are obtained for uh, Mohr Coulomb model. So let's see the applications of Mohr Coulomb model. So Mohr Coulomb model is generally sufficient to model the stability analysis for slopes, embankments, abutments, for ultimate load analysis for bearing capacity problems, punching shear, for soil structure bond failure, for ground, uh, ground anchors, soil nails, geotextiles, for excavation problems with basic behavior. So this is uh, something to be noted for uh, uh, most routine excavation problems where you are interested in the basic behavior of the soil uh, and the uh, soil structure interaction, Mohr Coulomb is sufficient. So let's see uh, why and where do we uh, need the advanced models. So advanced models are required if you have to do a detailed analysis such as a settlement analysis of foundation and embankment on soft soil. For this you would have to consider undrained or over consolidated uh, uh, sills and, and clay stratas. Uh, you would have to deal with the consolidation of soft soils. And the another area where these advanced models are required if you want to do a detailed analysis of deep excavation with detailed behavior. So the difference uh, for us for this particular session uh, since we're looking at uh, a very uh, very objectively deep excavations I would say uh, if you have to do a basic analysis or a basic behavior uh, representation of excavation uh, more coulomb would be sufficient but if you if you are dealing with uh, soil strata which are complex and uh, are uh, considered to be soft soil or uh, are uh, can undergo decent amount of consolidation uh, uh, then you would need the advanced models. So here uh, you can see there are different stiffness parameters for the advanced constitutive model. So uh, I'll not go into all these details but I'll just uh, uh, briefly mention something, some points that are uh, of uh, relevance uh, to uh, most of the geotechnical engineers. So there are different types of modulus of uh, elasticity for soil or Young's modulus and uh, as you can see they are denoted as E50, EOID and EUR. So E50 as you can see it's a secant, uh, secant Young's modulus at 50% of shear failure in the triaxial test carried out at uh, carried out under reference pressure P ref. So Mohr Coulomb model uh, in itself largely uses E50 as uh, the modulus of elasticity. Then there are there is uh, EOED, which is actually the tangential odometer modulus at reference pressure. So for this we have to perform odometer uh, test, primary loading, and then we have EUR, which is unloading and reloading. Young's modulus. 
and uh, again at uh, reference pressure. So there are different guidelines when you are dealing with different types of uh, soil types. You should use different type of uh, uh, Young's modulus. So these are all the parameters that you have to throw in advanced constitutive material models. If you are dealing with the uh, more coulomb alone, then uh, largely you would be using E50. Then there are additional parameters that are uh, required to complete the definition of uh, uh, advanced material models. And uh, you can see they are determined based on different types of field tests that are accounted for. So what? Uh, so since there are so many tests and so many parameters uh, that you to you have to account for, so what are the advantages of uh, doing all this as compared to more coulomb? So the advantage is are that advanced material models show better non-linear formulation of soil behavior in general, and you can use for both soft soils and harder types of soil whereas more coulomb goes well with the uh, harder types of soils where uh, not uh, there is no uh, significant consolidation or settlement occurring then uh, there is a distinction between primary loading and unloading and reloading so the advanced material models could uh, can account for uh, the primary loading that is actually coming from the earth pressure directly and uh, then uh, unloading because the uh, soil strata is excavated so there is unloading of the structure so sorry of the soil strata so that could cause soil heaving for that we require a different uh, Young's modulus that is EUR so uh, more coulomb uh, uses just one uh, E50 whereas uh, advanced uh, material models use E50 EUR uh, wherever it is needed so therefore, there is a distinction that you could catch when you are using advanced um, uh, material model. Then the stress history of pre-consolidation stresses could be accounted for uh, when you are dealing with uh, using uh, advanced material models. And different stiffnesses for different stress paths based on the standard test. This is just uh, what I discussed uh, about uh, the different uh, young models and then uh, they are suitable for unloading situation with simultaneous devatoric uh, loading which is actually the definition of excavation in terms of numerical analysis so uh, unloading situations means that you are uh, excavating your uh, uh, earth mass and as in when you are excavation, excavating your earth mass you are developing uh, uh, the devatoric uh, loading onto the structure due to the unloading and uh, this is uh, also essential when you are you want to do a detailed analysis of uh, deep excavation and unstable soil strata because uh, as you see as you go uh, as you go, go deeper into the earth you are taking out huge chunk of uh, earth mass so you are causing a lot of earth uh, uh, earth load to be removed from the soil strata so it can result in huge uh, heaving at the base of uh, the excavation sites which could be very critical but having said all that about the advanced uh, more coulomb material model uh, we still don't uh, use uh, it that often because uh, of its uh, difficulties in catching all these parameters from all different uh, field uh, tests so therefore more coulomb model with correct parameters may give better results than using incorrect parameters from uh, approximate tests with the uh, uh, advanced material models. So it's something like it is better to be uh, more aware about what uh, shortcomings you have rather than over assessing the, uh, your, uh, uh, your stents. So let's see how the material actually behaves in uh, uh, excavation process. So first of all, there is a huge unloading uh, due to excavation, like I just mentioned. Uh, vertical unloading uh, due to removal of the earth mass 
at the excavation bottom and then there is horizontal unloading behind uh, the wall uh, and that may be accompanied with plastic uh, 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 shear failure. Then we have a primary loading due to pre-stressing. So if you are dealing with the uh, uh, tiebacks which are bonded and or which are pre-stressed, then there is a primary pre-stressing force that is exerted. Then um, the uh, the modified monocoulomb method is preferred because of uh, its ability to account for non-linear elastic unloading and reloading. Uh, it's able to account for shear plasticity due to a horizontal unloading and stiffness uh, for better prediction of trough settlement. So I, and I can imagine that this was a lot of uh, information in a very short time interval. So what I'm trying to do here is uh, summarize the uh, material behavior that we just discussed in uh, bullet points and very precise uh, 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 notes formation. So more coulomb gives unrealistic deformations provided you are working with the uh, unstable soil strata. Otherwise you are good to go with more coulomb. Now why we say it gives unrealistic deformations because it uses single uh, E value which is uh, Young's modulus and fails to cater the complex materials at various zones. It uh, leads to overestimation over the bottom heave and uh, sometimes the heave of the soil, uh, the, sometimes heave of soil occurs behind the wall also uh, which is uh, hard to account for and uh, this is what uh, Mohr Coulomb does that if there is an uh, unloading then it will cause a huge heaving without even realizing that there is a wall to support it uh, directly. Then uh, the soil below the excavation behaves with EUR that is uh, the Young's modulus for unloading and reloading and the soil which is behind the wall behaves uh, with the stiffness between EUR and E50. But more Coulomb uses just E50 for all these locations and which results in a conservative uh, uh, values. So let's see the advantages uh, of the advanced Mohr Coulomb. It gives qualitative realistic deformations. Soil stiffness for isotropic loading, shearing and unloading reloading can be catered for automatically in the model. It gives more realistic bottom heave and improved settlement uh, trough behind wall. So like I said, if you have uh, more information, more parameters, more field tests, you can more accurately uh, simulate the soil behavior and account for all these uh, uh, phenomena. Then let's talk about how to put this together uh, and uh, create an, uh, a numerical model and how to simulate the supporting uh, system. We were talking about how to simulate soil all this time. Now let's move on to the structural component as how to simulate uh, the supporting system. So let's start with anchors and tiebacks because they are very popular. So anchors and tiebacks are designed for axial forces so they must be modeled as 1D truss members and there are two types of anchors and tiebacks bonded and unbonded. So if you can see this image uh, here Let's say this is the soil strata and you have these red lines that depict uh, your anchors or tiebacks. So if you're dealing with bonded tiebacks, you should ensure the nodal connectivity all throughout the length of these uh, uh, 1D truss members so that the uh, soil mesh is connected to the uh, your tieback mesh. But if you're dealing with unbonded uh, tiebacks, then you should just uh, have the nodal connectivity at the end and in the start of uh, your tieback. You need not uh, divide the member and make sure that the nodes are connected with the soil mesh all throughout. And if they are pre-stressed uh, tiebacks then pre-stressing forces should be applied in the actual direction onto these uh, tiebacks here. Then if you are uh, simulating uh, soil nails, then they are modeled exactly like uh, tiebacks. Uh, they are more or less truss members. Uh, 
uh, and uh, there is nothing like unbonded or bonded for uh, soil nails so they are always considered as bonded so make sure the nodal connectivity is maintained between the soil mesh and the soil nail uh, mesh then uh, excavation bracing so since excavation bracings resist the actual uh, deformations or actual uh, forces uh, we model them as stress members and not as B members and uh, since we are modeling them as stress members and there is actually uh, nothing uh, outside the plane to support it therefore uh, if you divide this uh, member into number of smaller pieces or number of smaller members then this will cause errors in your analysis because it's a truss member it cannot support uh, out of plane bending or deflection and uh, frankly that is not our uh, uh, our interest to determine the bending of the uh, struts so therefore uh, we are using truss members so make sure that you don't divide them as you model uh, uh, as you model uh, in the soil nails or tiebacks then modeling of uh, uh, walls as uh, uh, in 2d analysis and 3d analysis they may differ so for 2d analysis the soil is modeled as uh, with plain strain members and the wall is modeled as beam member now why we are modeling the wall as beam here is that and not as stress because we are interested in uh, the bending uh, moments we are interested in the actual force we are interested in the shear force or the shear effects in the wall so that could be captured with B member only in 2D analysis so uh, and make sure since the wall is con uh, connected uh, with the uh, soil strata continuously uh, make sure the nodal connectivity is maintained so your B member should be divided all along the length and connected to the soil strata and if you are uh, dealing with uh, a 3D excavation problem then the soil is modeled with solids and as you can see uh, the plates are modeled or the wall is modeled with plate elements and the color of the two meshes are different so it goes to show that there is a different uh, 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 member a different member type with different material property with different mesh but uh, if you look closely at the boundary you will be able to see that the nodal connectivity is maintained throughout so that the stresses could be uh, transferred from the uh, soil onto the walls and the, uh, they can be resisted. So make sure nodal connectivity is maintained whether it is 2D analysis or 3D analysis for uh, wall uh, modeling. So now let's uh, compare our conventional approach uh, uh, for using uh, it for deep excavation. That conventionally the excavation support systems are designed based on the structural limit equilibrium that prevents uh, the structural failure of the support wall and uh, uh, as we saw in the previous chapters that engineers just determine the earth pressure uh, and uh, apply them onto the structural components of the supporting wall and this perform the structural design so this uh, methodology works fine for uh, your shallow excavations but for deep excavations there are certain problems let's see what are the limitations or problems so this these methods generally result in excessive wall deformations and ground movements uh, these methods are uh, relate ground movement to exca excavation support system stiffness and basal stability which is which are based on plane strain analysis that do not accurately represent the nature of deep excavations. So deep excavation behavior as we have seen all throughout this presentation is uh, completely different. Uh, we are dealing with the different uh, 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 structural system altogether. So these methods don't accurately represent it. Then there is another uh, major uh, uh, phenomena that occurs with deep foundations and there, that is not with the uh, uh, shallow uh, excavations and that is excessive excavation induced movements and these movements can cause damage 
or even possible collapse in the adjacent structures. So we need uh, 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 accu uh, sorry we have to accurately predict uh, the lateral wall deflections, surface settlement because these are the important design criteria in the analysis and design of excavation support system. Since uh, uh, everything boils down to the economy of the support system, you must accurately understand what are the forces coming onto it and how optimally you can design it to make it a economical proposition. And direct and quantitative prediction of ground movements are not easy task. So they are not simple straightforward formulations that you can use from the books and uh, do the design when you are dealing with deep, uh, deep excavations. And therefore finite element models or numerical analysis are required for a realistic uh, study of the interactions between the soil and the excavation support system. So to consolidate what we just discussed uh, in the previous slide, I have put them in a tabular format where you can see uh, the comparison of conventional and numerical analysis approach against key points. So the soil behavior first of all is uh, simulated by Terzaghi's uh, and Peck and Peck formula in uh, uh, that were coined in 1967 or 19, 1969. And uh, the Mohr Coulomb model and modified Mohr Coulomb uh, constitutive material models are preferred in uh, numerical analysis approach. And uh, the earth pressure, as we have seen uh, based on uh, formulas, are uh, are obtained as an input parameter in uh, uh, in the conventional approach. And for the numerical analysis approach, uh, we use uh, constitutive material models and the output of the analysis is actually the earth pressure that is being exerted on your structural system of the supporting structure. Then uh, uh, excavation sequence has a major impact on the stress history uh, which cannot be considered under a conventional approach but in numerical analysis you can consider it uh, easily. Then uh, excessive excavation induced movements cannot be considered in your under your conventional approach which can be uh, easily simulated realistically under numerical analysis approach. And settlement of soil related to the support is uh, you cannot uh, it's not possible to account for this kind of uh, relative settlement uh, using conventional approach because the formulas are not tuned uh, to uh, accommodate these kinds of uh, variations. So uh, and these variations could be monitored easily in your uh, numerical analysis approach. And for that you can apply interface elements along the support height so that you can see the relative uh, settlement that is occurring. And uh, in terms of design, conventional approach uh, leads to a conservative and expensive design. Now I am talking in uh, in light with the deep excavations or referring to deep excavations. I'm not talking about shallow excavation here. So for deep excavation the design is conservative and expensive whereas uh, a numerical analysis approach gives optimal forces so you can uh, uh, do an accurate and economical design. So this brings us to the end of chapter and let's quickly go over the summary, the points that we learned in this chapter. So Moore Coulomb model is most commonly used to constitutive material model for slope stability, bearing capacity calculation, soil structure bond failure, excavation problems with basic behavior. For nonlinear compaction behavior required for settlement analysis on soft soil and deep excavation for detailed behavior hardening models such as modified Mohr Coulomb is recommended. Excavation causes soil heaving due to the unloading which can be captured accurately with modified Mohr Coulomb. Modified Mohr Coulomb can vary 
the E value which is the uh, Young's modulus for soil as per the change in the stresses while Mohr Coulomb alone uh, uses a single value. Modifying Mohr Coulombs requires parameters from different field tests and thus it is only uh, used if it is uh, a critical project. So it's not a commonly used uh, uh, material model. For bonded tiebacks, soil nails, truss members are connected with soil mesh at all points. And for unbonded tiebacks, nodal connectivity is only at the start and at the end point. So basically for unbonded tiebacks, you don't uh, maintain the nodal connectivity all throughout. Then uh, if you're modeling wall in 2D analysis, uh, uh, then you are modeling them as beam, while in 3D analysis they are modeled as plates and the nodal connectivity with soil mesh must be ensured in both cases. And the conventional method is not suitable for deep excavation as it doesn't consider soil structure interaction, excessive excavation induced movements and relative settlement. So therefore Numerical analysis is used which, uh, which considers the above and gives accurate design force for optimal structural design of your shoring members. I hope the points are duly noted. So this brings us to the last chapter of this uh, uh, session where we'll be talking about the deep excavation for a high-rise building construction. So this is the case study that we'll be covering today. The, uh, the building that was uh, that is being constructed is, uh, is called Odeon Tower. The designers are Stoltanchi, uh, Stoltanchi Baki and Vinci Construction in uh, France and the uh, details of the site are something like this. The structure would be 170 meter in height and uh, it has 10 underground parking levels. So basically the requirement for the excavation would be about uh, 130 feet approximately which is 42 meter. And uh, this project as you can see from the uh, site itself is uh, carried out on extremely steep sloping land and uh, it is very asymmetric and you can see uh, the the area is highly urbanized and densely populated and between uh, in the area with the sloping profile or uh, the uh, sloping uh, terrain they had to construct this uh, building. So it is an unusual project like I mentioned it is a 48 uh, uh, stories in a highly urbanized uh, environment and this building will be placed right in the uh, center of this uh, community and uh, it uh, requires uh, the clearing of uh, of about a dozen uh, houses in the area and then they have to cut through the uh, rock slopes which are considered to be stable enough but uh, still there is a huge excavation requirement for this uh, particular structure. Once completed, this uh, building would be the tallest uh, building in uh, Monaco and one of the biggest or the tallest buildings in France. We have 70 meters of excavation that is underground and uh, the total story height is 150. So this is the initial uh, uh, state of the site before demolition. There are dozens of houses that, uh, that would be demolished in this uh, particular area. And the soil structure is also, uh, the soil strata that they were dealing with is, was also an interesting one. There were different type of soil, strat uh, uh, soil strata. Thankfully there was uh, no water uh, in the area so therefore uh, uh, drainage or the poor water pressure wasn't uh, a big issue with this, uh, with these, uh, this size of uh, excavation. And uh, here you can see this is uh, a glimpse of uh, uh, tie anchors being applied and uh, for this they are using micro piles. So basically the work uh, on this site began in 2009 
and uh, uh, the complete structure would be ready in 2014 in July so it is still under construction and because of the steepness and the height of the structure they uh, they adopted staggered retaining wall construction so that they can uh, erect the wall uh, and mount uh, the uh, equipments and then uh, do the excavation further and then uh, move down in the step formation. So here you can see it will give you a better idea about uh, what is a staggered uh, retaining wall construction. So on the left hand side if you can see this is the Berlin wall uh, that was uh, uh, that has already been created and these are the micro piles that have been used as uh, 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 tie backs and uh, uh, this is the completed uh, retaining wall uh, site and you can see the staggered uh, construction or uh, step uh, stepped uh, construction so that they can mount the equipments on and uh, carry on the excavation as they proceed so there were uh, there were several uh, micro piles used to pro to provide the required anchorage at the top and the worksite itself uh, is uh, looks very cluttered and uh, there you can see there are so many equipments in the site and since it's a very sensitive project so uh, engineers uh, or designers couldn't take any chances so they had established all sorts of uh, uh, equipments uh, to ensure uh, the construction of the wall is in plumb so they had uh, 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 piezometers, they had the extensometers, they had inclinometers, they had different targets that they were uh, constantly monitoring uh, for uh, any kind of uh, uh, settlement or movement uh, and monitoring the creep and shrinkage of the wall. So uh, the site was uh, extremely cl cluttered and therefore for uh, once they were uh, doing a certain level of excavation then they had to move everything and set it up again. So it was a very challenging uh, project site to work on. And uh, when we are talking about these instruments or equipments, they are not uh, miniature tools that, you know, like a palm top that could be just uh, kept anywhere uh, on the site. They were full size equipments and every time uh, uh, the excavation was proceeded they had to move them and uh, set it up. So the whatever space they had was already being used up by the equipments that were there. And on top of that, the access to the site was uh, uh, made possible only by a one-way street. So a one-way street in such a site and uh, that too, uh, they had to block the street from uh, uh, 7 p.m. in the night time to 7 a.m. And during that time, they have to unload all the material that they would need for that days of activity all the equipments were brought in during that time set it up and then uh, uh, they were not allowed to use the street thereafter and during that time they used to uh, focus on the construction so they had to manage the time very well otherwise it would blow uh, out of proportion in terms of uh, construction cost So this is a schematic diagram of the retaining system that was ab adopted. There was a layer of soft soil, so they had to go for fiberglass anchors also. And then there were uh, staggered uh, retaining walls, as you can see, with micro piles to uh, performing the work of uh, tie back anchors. And uh, you can see there, so basically here there was a combination of different types of supporting systems. Tie backs, retaining walls, uh, um, and uh, the uh, strut supports when the excavation was uh, being carried out in the confined area. So there were different equipments and different uh, methods used. So the major constraints of uh, this project site itself was it was uh, in a highly urbanized area. So there were several adjacent structures. So there was uh, the neighborhood was densely populated. There were schools and the other community uh, centers and active uh, areas where the foundations were there and they cannot afford to disturb the uh, uh, foundation of the adjacent structures 
So the excavation sequence must be carried out in a step-by-step -step process uh, with uh, layers uh, in uh, uh, of uh, short uh, height. So basically, the ob what were the objectives for three D final element from this uh, for this particular project? So first of all, they wanted to estimate the global displacements, and in particularly at the vicinity of the retaining wall and the surrounding area. They wanted to estimate the settlement or the uplift uh, uplift of the tower under the project loads. They want to appreciate the global behavior of the structure by taking into account the 3D effects like uh, arching effects and the, of the up, upstream of the walls. They had to validate all different types of ground support systems that they were using if they are working uh, as expected or not. And then they have to check the overall stability. So basically, all this pointed towards a 3D finite element model because they wanted to uh, achieve uh, uh, the global displacement, settlement, the uplift pressure, uh, the global effects like uh, arching of the upstreams of the walls. Uh, then uh, they have to validate these type of uh, ground supporting uh, system that they are using and they have to check for the overall stability. Uh, would the entire slope kind of slide? Uh, taking the excavation and the retaining or the supporting structure with it. So that all that uh, pointed towards a 3D finite element analysis or numerical analysis. So let me briefly uh, go over the project details once again. The tower building, uh, the building tower is 160 meter high, 10 levels in basement. Retaining structures include 15 meter of high solder micropile walls with 48 micropiles, 20 meter high solder uh, pile wall with 22 piles, 50 millimeter thick of deep diaphragm wall and which are 38 meter in height and 366 pre-stress anchors were used. So your uh, the 3D model should uh, have all these components modeled precisely at the exact location and uh, so that they can assess whether these uh, uh, for designing these uh, members the accurate forces uh, are obtained or not. So uh, some components for the finite element model how, uh, how they were uh, uh, how they simulated the uh, real situation. So for soil and rock uh, we used uh, solid elements. For micro piles and piles, we used beam elements. For uh, uh, soldier micro pile wall, which is a combination of short creeds and uh, micro piles, we used plate and beam element combination. And similarly, for uh, uh, soldier pile wall, uh, we used uh, uh, beam, uh, plate and beam element combination. For diaphragm walls, we used plate elements, and plate elements were also used for uh, simulating slabs. And for anchors, we used embedded truss members. And uh, for free part or unbonded uh, anchors, we disconnected them from the solid mesh. And uh, for fixed anchors or bonded anchors, we connected them to the solid mesh, ensuring the nodal connectivity. These were the soil properties uh, that were uh, used. So they, these are the name of the five different soil layers uh, that were uh, uh, that were found on those sites, and uh, uh, Mohor Coulomb model was actually used for uh, uh, simulating the constitutive uh, uh, behavior of these soil layers. So we didn't use uh, modified Mohor Coulomb at the site because Mohor Coulomb was sufficient to give the uh, accurate results that were needed. So this is the finite element model as you can see. So there were some villas, high schools and other uh, uh, other structures in the close vicinity. And this was the ODN excavation that was to be performed. And this is a full-blown finite element model. 
and you can see uh, the neural connective being maintained as uh, the excavation is uh, proceeded. And uh, these are the different components of the finite element model. Uh, if you pull them out separately, so you can see the uh, slabs here, the diaphragm walls, uh, the surrounding walls uh, created with plate elements. You can see the micro piles and the piles and anchors that were uh, modeled. Uh, you can see the diaphragm wall, actually that is the wall that was surrounding it, and the uh, the barrets that were uh, like uh, thick walls continuing from the right from the foundation to the top. So all different components were uh, modeled uh, as uh, they were observed or they were uh, uh, to behave on the site. And then the construction was carried out in uh, uh, different stages. So first stage was the stress field initialization, which is the uh, stable so soil strata with no excavation uh, 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 happening just yet. Then we will uh, we set up the soldier micropile wall. Then we did the excavation and activated the pre-stressed anchors. Then we set up the soldier uh, pile wall and then we did the excavation and activated the pre-stressing anchors. Then we set up the diaphragm walls, barret, uh, barretus and buttrets. Then excavated and activated the pre-stressing anchors. So everything uh, went in a step-by-step -step process and then we ex uh, pro proceeded with the excavation and activation of basement levels uh, and the application of the gravitational load on the barrets. Then the slabs were activated which were the structural component and then the service loads were applied on top of them. So once these uh, uh, stages were formulated and uh, thrown into the numerical analysis model, the results were obtained as uh, shown here. So you can see the horizontal displacement of the soil strata when you are doing the excavation. You can see the vertical displacement you can see the vertical displacements of the walls that were there. You can also see the plastic zones uh, that are happening behind the backfill of the, uh, the retaining structures. So all the results that were uh, uh, needed could be uh, formulated through numerical analysis uh, model and all these inputs were thrown in in one uh, model and uh, in one run the results were extract, extracted. For those of you who are uh, curious that what uh, tool was used to simulate uh, this uh, deep excavation problem for the foundation and the uh, construction of the Odin Tower, so let me sh uh, share uh, the software name with you. It was Midas Civil, uh, sorry, pardon me, it was Midas GTS that was used for the geotechnical investigation uh, and uh, modeling the full-blown finite element model in 3D to estimate uh, uh, the horizontal, vertical displacements and the forces in the members. So this concludes uh, the session for today and before we leave I would like to remind you that uh, the next session that is coming up next week it's, uh, it's on uh, coupled analysis and uh, seismic design application. It will be on September 18th and the time will be 3 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Thanks a lot for joining in today. This is Arun Sharma from Midasoft signing off. Have a great day ahead. Thank you.